My name is Sarah Johnson. I'm the director with the Share the Beach program. Our previous live that got started officially got cut off, so we're picking right back up. Um, as I was saying a minute ago, this is what a typical sea turtle crawl looks like. This is what our volunteers are looking for every morning. Um, and that crawl is just like it says. A sea turtle crawls when it comes up out of the water. They don't have legs like we do. They have flippers, so they don't have feet to stand on. Um, and so they do just crawl. They pull themselves across the sand. And so our sea turtles that nest here are the majority of the time going to be a loggerhead and they have what's called an alternating crawl pattern so rather than taking both flippers moving them forward and pulling it once they alternate so they'll take one and then another and pull this way and so we get what's called an alternating crawl kemp's ridleys will also crawl the same way green sea turtles and leatherbacks will crawl with a parallel crawl so they'll reach both at once and it looks much different uh, they also have slightly longer flippers so they get more of a long and skinny flipper pattern whereas our logger heads are a little stubbier i guess you could say and so to illustrate that i have a couple of things here and so i'm going to pick this up so everyone can get an idea this is the shell or the carapace the back shell from a logger head sea turtle and this is what we get nesting on our beaches most of the time and so this is a really big turtle it's probably the same size as me once you add everything and so along with its head down here and it gets that name loggerhead because its head is so big compared to the rest of its body our other sea turtle species have slightly smaller heads in comparison with their shell size and so these are what we get nesting pulling up on the sand there she's probably 250 to 300 pounds so that's a really heavy turtle so they leave the very distinct marking when they come up on the beach they crawl up she with her back flippers digs down into the sand and makes a nest chamber and then she drops all of her eggs in there into a clutch she'll drop between 80 to 120 eggs at a time and cover it all up my little nest diagram here is far less messy than what she typically does but this gives you an idea she throws and scatters some sand around and then crawls away and then leaves those eggs they incubate in the sand on their own she doesn't monitor the nest she doesn't come to check on the babies um, she's too busy laying more nests so a female turtle will nest three to four times in a season usually about two weeks apart so she comes up lays a clutch goes back out eats a bunch kind of hangs around the area comes back up about two weeks later, lays another nest, repeats this throughout the season. Um, so we are out here looking for these. And so when one of our, our volunteers find one of these, I hope it's okay if I dig a little with that. Okay. So when one of our volunteers find these, we don't have these handy markers saying, hey, there's a sea turtle nest here. Uh, we have to go find those eggs on our own. And so we would come down and start just gently moving the sand with the side of our hands because we don't want fingernails or anything to damage those eggs. They're very delicate. Um, they can certainly withstand being under the sand, but they're not hard like a chicken egg. They're more leathery and smooth and round like a ping pong ball. And so this is actually a ping pong ball but this is pretty much the size and shape of our loggerhead sea turtle eggs these are about the same as well and so she'll lay these down in the sand in a clutch that looks kind of like an upside down light bulb so it's a narrow and then it widens out at the bottom and you can see that in our nest diagram over here or our nest model so We've got the eggs down in the sand. They're incubating. They stay under the sand for about 60 days, 55 to 60 days. Our Dauphin Island sea turtles tend to like to hatch a little earlier than that. They go closer to 50 to 55 days. It just has to do with temperature, dryness, uh, really rainy weather. We'll see them incubate a little bit longer because it keeps them cooler. Um, so you really do think about it like cooking. When it's really hot and dry, they will cook faster. Um, and then our ratio of males to females that come out of that nest will be determined by the overall temperature and so we don't on the gulf coast here think about it being cool but this is cooler for sea turtle nesting habitat so we do tend to see more males come out of our nests uh, cooler temperatures produce more males hotter temperatures will produce more females and uh, so we do typically see more males which is probably why we don't see the giant numbers of nests here along the northern Gulf Coast like we do down on the southern coast of Florida where they just get hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds uh, in any given season. 
because they have more females. And those females do return to the nest, uh, to nest on the general area of the beach where they hatched out. So if we have a sea turtle that hatches out right here off of the east end Dauphin Island beach, it won't necessarily return to exactly the east end Dauphin Island beach, but it'll come back within probably five to 10 miles direction and nest in that general area. So they do return to where they hatched from. Um, all right, some other things that I brought out, and Mendel, stop me whenever you want to jump in with anything. <laughs> I'll just keep going. Um, some other things that we brought out. So I showed you the carapace, the shell, um, and what goes along. Yeah. That, so I'm not sure if it. I don't know. It's yeah. Got a little clip on it, okay. just so it doesn't get in the sand. That's probably a good idea. Stick it in your pocket. I. There we go. Um, that's not big enough. All right. So we have, um, we have the preserved skull that goes with our carapace here. You can see its beak is intact. Those are the mouth parts. Loggerheads eat small crustaceans um, and hard things like the fish. So they've got this nice hard beak to crack, to crush those. And so on our skull here, that's not covered with the scales anymore. Um, it's no longer got its beak either because there's nothing to attach it. And so we do have beak parts here and they are separate. Um, they are keratin like fingernails and things like that. Um, and that would fit here. That's the upper beak. And then this would go on the lower jaw and those fit together so it can crush and grab and bite things to eat. And then here, so this is part of the carapace here, the, uh, the bones that form the edge of the carapace. And so sea turtle shells are made out of their bones. They are made out of their rib bones. And so the ribs come from the spine and they connect to these edge bones right here. And then they are covered with these scales or scoots. And that's what forms the carapace of the turtle. And so when, when it dies and it all kind of breaks down, it just goes to bones and these scoots are no longer visible. That is kind of like, skin and tissue and things like that for the sea turtle. In cartoons, a lot of times <laughs> turtles like take their shells off when they, you know, yep. you see them or, pull their shell off yeah, or, or yeah. completely pull themselves in where there's no visible sign of them anymore. And uh, very few turtles can actually pull themselves completely inside their shell. Um, box turtles are a type of terrestrial turtle that are one of the few that can completely close up. Sea turtles can't pull themselves in at all. They're not designed that way. Their flippers are very big and sea turtle shells are very much part of their body. It's just like our skeleton. We can't bail on our skeleton and neither can they. Um, and so just the, the different species of turtles uh, or determines if it's able to draw itself in at all for protection. And sea turtles are not one that does that. I always like to point out that it's the turtle's rib cage, the shell yes. is. So if you feel your ribs here and in the back, that is like the turtle's rib cage. They do have shoulder bones and hip mm -hmm. bones, but their shell is expanded to encase their shoulder bones and hip bones. So you can see this is the spine right here. Just like we have a backbone, we have vertebra. These are the sea turtles vertebra. And then these are the ribs coming off of it. Just like our ribs extend out from our, both, both from our chest here and from our spine in the back. We do have ribs in the back that extend. And so that's what makes up a sea turtle's shell. And so it is very much part of its body and not something that the sea turtle can just decide to hop out of when it feels like it. So as far as the nest monitoring goes, after you locate the nest, what happens then? So once we have located a nest and determined that there are eggs present, found our little ping pong balls, uh, we do mark it. And so this stake is just one of the, just one of four that we would place around that nest. We get a uh, mesh screen. It's just wire mesh that we place over the top of the nest and that keeps predators out. Um, and then we'll completely, uh, we'll lay that down over the center of the nest and we'll put stakes on the four corners to hold that down and we wrap it in green flagging tape. And I didn't do that out here because that is plastic flagging tape and it's not something that we want to waste uh, because it's just more plastic that is going out into the trash. <laughs> so I try to avoid using it when I don't need to. Um, but it's bright, it's colorful, it gets people's attention uh, so they don't miss it, walk into it, and that protects them from being walked on, being driven on, or any predators getting to it. And it's also protected by the force of law, not just this uh, is, some yes. plastic flagging ribbon, right? Exactly. So this is our nice yellow, can't miss it, 
um, Florida, um, Alabama, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, sea turtle sign, sea turtle nest, do not disturb, violators will be fined um, or subject to criminal charges and uh, can face some pretty, yes, can face some pretty serious charges. Uh, so definitely don't go messing with the nests. Not even for fun, because even that, if you just kind of mess with it for fun, is also an offense. And then as the as it gets closer to hatching time, after they've been mm -hmm. identified, and you can pretty much tell when they were laid, because if you find that track, it's a pretty safe assumption that that was laid that hours night before. Mm -hmm. because the tracks don't. Um, yeah, they're not preserved well. So no, they're going to wash out. They're going to get blown away. We can certainly have tracks survive several days if it's pretty calm conditions. But we are out on the beaches every single morning. And so we know when we get new ones. And then when we do find them, once we've marked it, worked it all up, we completely erase this track. So that way volunteers coming along the next morning don't find it and think they found a brand new one or get all confused. Um, we can also get something called a false crawl. So when a turtle comes up and leaves this kind of track, but for some reason decides not to nest we call it a false crawl and so we definitely don't want to leave those tracks there because we won't know if those are a new one or an old one because no one will have there won't be any nest marked out in the middle of those tracks if it's a false crawl so we definitely need to make sure that we erase those and then what happens at the end of the uh, incubation period? What do the volunteers do? So that's the fun part. Um, we do something called nest sitting and we don't just sit out there starting at day 50 or 55 and just watch it and wait and, you know, hope for the best. Um, we do have a few different things that we can do to determine if a nest is getting ready to hatch and we can see it physically. Uh, the center of the nest is typically pretty smooth throughout the season as wind blows across it, it keeps it smooth. It will get a, a indentation where it has caved kind of in in the middle. Um, and that's from the turtles hatching out underneath, scratching, pulling, um, and that sand kind of falling in around the new spaces that they are creating by moving down under there. So we see that dip in the sand, we know that there's activity under there. We can also use a stethoscope to listen, which sounds crazy, but it's amazing. You can put it in the side. We put it off to the side of the nest and you can listen. You have to have everyone around you very quiet though, because if everyone's wait, anyone's wiggling their toes, it sounds just like turtles scratching underneath. But it is a scratching sound that you can hear uh, with a stethoscope. So we can get a really good idea based on the intensity and the frequency of those sounds. Uh, when they're really, really active and getting ready to come out, we call it waterfall sounds because it does kind of sound like the rushing of a waterfall um, as that sand is really more actively falling. And then when they do finally come out we call it a boil they all come out at once this is a survival tactic the more you know bigger numbers safety and uh, and they all come bursting out at once and they will go rushing toward the water in a perfect situation and they do that because as you know most beaches are you've got this flat beach this way and you have the dunes this way that are going to form a large dark area behind them and so the sky toward the water is going to be brighter than the sky behind the dunes because the dunes create that large shadow. So they're going to rush toward the water. The things that we do have to fight now and one of the reasons that we are present at nests is to help with any that get oriented by lights. So bright white lights on parking garages or condos or homes or supermarket parking lots um, or anything like that. Flashlights on the beach can disorient them and they're going to want to go toward that brightest light source because they think All right, we're back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, perils of trying to use technology out on a, a beach in a slightly remote location. Um, I don't even remember where it was. We were talking about the boil and the, the turtles lights. heading for the water and the light, the lights being an issue. So uh, sea turtles are very easily disoriented by bright lights. That goes for nesting females too. It is one of the reasons that sometimes they will false crawl. Um, sea turtles are designed for life in the ocean. Therefore, their eyes are designed for life in the ocean. So on land, their eyesight is very similar to our eyesight in the water. So if you think about it in reverse, it's real hard for us to see in the water. It's hazy, it's blurry. Um, it's the same for them on land. And so bright lights are disorienting. Movement and noise from people around them can be, be very disorienting. So if you are ever lucky enough to be on a beach and see a sea turtle nesting, keep your lights off, no flash photography. Keep a good distance, 20 to 30 feet back at least, and stay low to the ground and stay quiet and just enjoy the experience. Uh, I know everyone wants to document everything these days, but sometimes we don't, we just want to let nature be nature. And they can get caught in things they can. left on the beach. Too. Yeah, so one of the other things that we try to educate on is 
bringing your items off of the beach at the end of the day. Don't leave any holes. Sea turtles can fall into them and get stuck. Um, not only nesting females, but also hatchlings. So even smaller holes um, are gonna pose an issue. So go out there, have fun, dig holes, and fill them in when you're finished at the end of the day. Um, bring all of your beach items in. Don't leave tents or chairs or toys or floats or anything like that. Um, we have had sea turtles get tangled up in those items. Um, we have had those items fall on top of a nest and made it really hard to find because we thought, well, what in the world is going on here? We can't find the eggs. It looks like she nested and we ended up finding them under a pile of beach toys. Um, so the, the items must have fallen down onto that nest after and so uh, it just poses one more obstacle to those sea turtles and to uh, make the beaches as normal for them as we possibly can. You know, we can go out there during the day and enjoy them and then clean them up and leave them how the turtles need them at night. So uh, Sarah mentioned that sea turtles are threatened and endangered. And so that's, uh, she did mention their natural predators. They put the screen over the nest to protect the hatchlings from their natural predators and you might um, wonder why they are protecting them from their natural predators as well as um, the, the dangers posed by humans but because their numbers are, have been so um, impacted by human activities um, you know the, there are efforts to protect them and um, preserve this you know these species uh, even from their natural predators because they need that boost uh, in their in their population. That's so, yeah, just one of that's just one of the things that we do. Uh, one of probably one of the only things that we do to mitigate their the natural impacts that a turtle faces. So uh, another another natural impact to turtle nests that we all just experienced a week and a half ago was the tropical storm. Um, it did impact many of our nests, but that is a natural occurrence. It's one of the reasons why sea turtles nest multiple times in a season. They nest in tropical storm hurricane territory. Uh, and so they are going to have nests lost to those natural disasters. Um, so we do not move nests when we have storms coming through. Our um, disturbing those eggs is going to do a lot more damage than potential washover. We never know the impact that a storm is gonna have until it passes. Um, so we don't want to risk disturbing those eggs when they could survive. Um, but we did have a lot of nests wash out with the recent tropical storm. The surge itself was just much higher than anybody Kind of expected in our area. So this program is only protecting mm -hmm. the um, sea turtles that are nesting and the hatchlings. Once they go back out into the ocean, um, at least the the share the beach program is not protecting them. They are still they're they're, they're on their own from from the from the extensive help they get mm -hmm. sort of in their uh, nursery phase, but they are still protected by the. Um, Endangered Species Act um, when they're out in the ocean. And there are other measures like turtle excluder devices that are required on fishing gear and, and other protections for them. Um, but can you talk about the, um, the, the, the reasons, the sort of the human impacts that have led to this situation? Sure. Um, so fishing is a big one, and obviously that's a big reason why tu turtle excluder devices are required on commercial fishing nets. Um, it's a hatch at the back of the net that um, on its own will not open, but a sea turtle is nice and big and heavy, and should they bump into it, they can escape that net. Uh, they are reptiles. They do have lungs. They need to breathe air, and so if they get caught up in a fishing net and are not able to surface for breath, they are going to drown. Um, and so that's why those turtle excluder devices have started being uh, are more of a requirement. Um, commercial fisheries are defi have definitely impacted sea turtle populations. Some of it's uh, human harvesting of eggs. Sea turtle eggs have been a delicacy for a long time and getting those kind of off of people's plates has taken a lot of time. There are many countries that still do it, um, but here in the U.S. that's illegal, illegal now. Um, other impacts like like I talked about are the lights um, and things like that and pollution, uh, b whether um, chemical pollution or physical pollution, physical pollution being things like uh, marine debris and trash that ends up in the ocean um, and sea turtles eat it. So things like plastic bags and straws and other uh, garbage that ends up out there, um, it, it's called biofouling and it puts off a smell. 
And I know foul to us, it means ew, stinky, but for whatever reason, biofouling to sea turtles in plastic smells really good, and so they want to eat it. Um, and so they fill up on that plastic. Uh, plastic bags look a whole lot like jellyfish when they're in the water, um, and jellyfish are a delicacy to sea turtles. They're like a little treat, and so they eat all that plastic. Their body can't break it down. They feel full, and then they don't eat anymore, and they eventually starve. And so um, there are a lot of things that are impacting sea turtles, and a lot of the reasons that they are endangered um, that we're trying to help with. So not only share the beach on land, but also trying to educate uh, public what they can do as far as reusable bags when you go to the store or you know not using straws, cutting down on your plastic consumption in general, single use plastics, especially since those create the biggest trash impact. Um, and plastics while recyclable are, are only recyclable to a certain point. They only break down so far and then they become microplastic Way. So they're always out there impacting the environment. So you, you did give a few tips for what people can do mm -hmm. when they're um, on the beach. Mm -hmm. Could you, uh, do you have any others? And then could you follow that with how people could get more involved if they want to through Share the Beach? Yeah, so um, another activity that everyone loves to do when they go to the beach is ghost crab hunting. Uh, it's a lot of fun. People get out there with their flashlights. They chase down the ghost crabs. They catch them. Um, and that's so fun. It's, it's a great time. And what everybody does is use those bright white flashlights. Um, but those can be an issue because you don't know if 50 feet down the beach there's a sea turtle. They're very quiet. They're not going to make any noise. Um, you may never see it, but those lights flashing across the beach could either scare her back into the water without nesting or it could disorient her. Uh, and we have had places where sea turtles have crawled and crawled and crawled around many times um, before they finally make it back out to the water because they've been so disoriented. So um, switching those out for uh, red or amber light is very helpful and you can even put like just a film over a the white The film is light. helpful. It's helpful. It's better than nothing. It's better than white light. Um, what you actually want to look for is a wavelength change. We want true red or amber light, not filtered red or amber light. Um, and so it's not easy to find. There are very few that actually make it, but um, astronomy flashlights are red. They're a 630 nanometer typically. Uh, it's a true red bulb uh, light that's emitted. And those are very sea turtle friendly. So maybe getting something like that, it'll still help you see the crabs. Your eyes will actually adjust better because you're not going from harsh white light to dark, you know, on they're and off. They're not expensive. They're not and expensive you might have at to all. Plan ahead. Yeah. And order they're really, them. yeah. They're not that expensive. Plan ahead definitely before you go to the beach. It's not something you're going to find in the in the shore store once you get down there, um, or in the surf store. So plan ahead. Um, have a red flashlight at the very least a red filter um, until you can get something more suitable. But that's definitely one other thing that people can do to help. And then how can they get involved with Share the Beach? So every April we have our volunteer meeting for the year. We invite everybody to come and learn about the program uh, and that is the point where we say we are accepting new volunteers. You can sign up. We have eight teams that function across the, street, uh, across the state. So Dauphin Island operates as a team and then across the bay in Baldwin County we've got another seven teams spread out across that area. So learn about what those teams are, where those teams are located, kind of figure out what works best for where you are. Um, and we do ask that our volunteers commit to at least one patrol every week and that's just one morning a week that's really easy um, to do patrols typically take about two hours you can walk the beach it's a gorgeous time to enjoy the sunrise it's peaceful you might find it um, and other ways to get involved are we have an adopt a nest program if you're not able to volunteer with the program you can adopt a nest and that is a monetary donation and then, and then you have adopted that nest for the season you'll get a certificate and you'll get nest updates um, we also have items through the alabama coastal foundation's shore store that you can purchase that will help benefit us um, goodies like uh, pint glasses that you can take when we do our little brewery events and uh, that will get you your first drink free and then any other drink that we do during those events will benefit us um, we have towels, there are beach signs if you have beachfront property and want to put a sign out that says, hey, it's sea turtle nesting season, you know, fill in your holes, turn off your lights, that kind of stuff. So go take a look. Um, and those are a few other ways that you can help us out and help our sea turtles out. And they can find that information on your website? They are. You can go to either place. So either sharethebeach.com or joinacf.org are the two places where you can go. And that's the program. So um, at this point, you've already passed your training period, is there? Yes, training is finished. We do that before the season starts. Uh, active sea turtle nesting season is May 1st. 
through uh, August 31st and that's active nesting and then we shift into just hatching out the rest of our nests that have been laid. Um, so we say the tip season fully runs May 1st through October 31st and so training is completed before the season starts in May. Do you have um, like a, a registration program where somebody could register sign up for emails or notifications so that they if they're interested this summer and they're looking forward to getting involved next summer and they want to you know they want that reminder for when yes. they need to join the you can go to the Alabama Coastal Foundation's website that's joinacf.org and you can sign up to be uh, on their newsletter list and you can select monthly newsletters you can select once a year newsletters or you know every time we have an update for you guys newsletters so whatever your preference is however many updates you would like to get you can sign up for those and we always include information about the share the beach program anything else you'd like to share no i think i've covered just about well, thank everything you so much for coming uh thank you for joining us uh, we are doing the boardwalk talks. We are continuing to do the boardwalk talks virtually first and third Wednesdays of the month at least for now um, This is because we are not opening them for people to gather in person due to COVID-19 um, <laughs> uh, Hopefully someday soon we will return to doing these as live in-person events and you can join us at the estuarium um, first and third Wednesdays of the month but for now please join our live streams and um, y'all have a good day